Fine. You're going to call up your rigorous investigation. You're going to publicly state that there is no underground group. Or these guys are going to take your balls. There are a lot of reasons a character becomes timeless. How they endure cultural shifts and evolving landscapes. Often it's because those people are iconoclasts. They challenge beliefs and institutions while making us question our own ideals and societal norms. But how does Tyler Durden both represent hundreds of years of philosophical debate while remaining so firmly cemented in late 90s pop culture? What makes the leader of Project Mayhem both terrifying and iconic? Tell you are by far the most interesting single serving friend I've ever met. Before this video gets spliced with vulgarities, make sure to subscribe to Nerdstalgic to stay up to date on all our latest videos. Released in 1999 and based on the 1996 book of the same name by author Chuck Palahniuk, Fight Club was directed by David Fincher with a script by Jim Yules. While the basic plot is simple, a depressed office worker becomes enamored by a crust punk soap maker. The story quickly spirals into self-discovery and what happens to us after the coming of age part of our life ends. Credited as only narrator, Edward Norton shines as our audience surrogate. Insecure and listless, he's the perfect mark for someone like Tyler Durden. Tyler was everything narrator wanted to be. He wears unkempt clothes, a mismatch of perfectly fitted thrift store finds, his hair is intentionally messy, and there's a wry smile that pulls us in to tell us that we're part of the club. We desperately want to be part of whatever Tyler is involved in because he is so effortlessly cool. He is the romanticized idea of a restless loner. With one look, we can tell this cat isn't showering often, slapping on whatever dirty clothes he gathered from a messy floor just to dumpster dive through alleys while smoking cheap cigarettes. Via Fincher's methodical lens and Pitt's effortless performance, Tyler Durden defined what we considered cool in the late 90s and early aughts. Despite the film being considered a commercial failure upon release, it found a cult audience in the still thriving DVD market. All of the main characters in Fight Club are what is commonly referred to as a searcher, a character in need of meaning or understanding that brings their inner self into focus. And for a while, Tyler seems to have found the ethereal it. He describes it as rock bottom, wherein the inability to lose anything grants us freedom. It's a mystery box we want to unravel because he seems to have it together so well. And that is the first part in Tyler's magic trick, making narrator and us feel like we could figure it all out. Before narrator meets Tyler, he's immersed himself in support groups just for the sense of community it gives him. But when Tyler shows up, he welcomes the lonely man with open arms. The two almost immediately start living together after narrator's apartment explodes and we're introduced to the house that Tyler is either renting or squatting in. Despite being so dilapidated, there's a romanticism in the house's presentation, a sort of modern idea of Neverland. What a shit hole. Fincher shoots wide open spaces that invite play. The two drive golf balls from the rooftop. They go on giggle-filled adventures to steal fat in order to make soap. But under all that play and joy, Tyler is laying the groundwork for his most dangerous aspect, his ideals. Tyler takes the aimless feeling of his victims and gives it a voice. He delivers perfect pop anthem sing-along choruses that soundtrack composers the Dust Brothers surround with thumping bass and looping samples. Tyler champions anti-capitalism, nihilism, and existentialism, but only their broad strokes, only what sounds cool after a few drinks in a dimly lit bar. At one point when Tyler is courting narrator, he asks if narrator knows what a duvet is. You know what a duvet is? Comfort. Blanket. Just a blanket. When he does, Tyler bemoans the fact that anyone, especially a hunter-gatherer, would know what a duvet is. Throughout the film, we see Tyler's disregard for anything he feels is occupying too much of his headspace. He makes narrator quit his job, he enlists more members to fuel his cult, yet constantly puts narrator in charge of training them. Again and again, Tyler manipulates the situation by making the work look like fun. He is forever Tom Sawyer, painting a fence trying to convince us how much fun it is. For a long stretch of the movie, we fall into the pop mantra of in Tyler we trust. And then there's his relationship with Marla Singer. Played wonderfully by Helena Bonham Carter, Marla is another searcher. Doing her best to attach meaning to her life, she poses at the same support groups as narrator. She's confident, self-sufficient, and comfortable with her sexuality. All of these are traits Tyler relates to and exploits when he feels he has the time or want. Otherwise, she's regulated to negging, abandonment, and gaslighting. 
He repeatedly abandons her, then engages physically. We see her become emotionally distraught again and again by his off-screen actions until she serves as the catalyst to Fight Club's greatest reveal. Tyler Durden and narrator are the same people. While this reveal is undeniably clever and the backbone of the story, it puts Tyler and Marla's relationship into a horrifying new light. When Tyler feels she's outstayed her welcome, he again thrusts the responsibility of the confrontation onto narrator. It is Fincher and Yules showing us that for all his bravado and catchphrases about rock bottom, Tyler is nothing without a small army to clean up his messes. It is antithetical to what he preaches again and again, the idea of a man with nothing to lose, not just surviving, but living a peak existence. Like a lot of fiction's greatest villains, Tyler wants to push his ideas onto the world. The group of disaffected men he assembles called themselves Project Mayhem, and their small acts of vandalism are at first almost guerrilla art, destroying computers inside window displays, vandalizing existing art. They quickly escalate until one member is killed. And even that moment is spun into an act of martyrdom. And we're told again, in Tyler, we trust. His name is Robert Paulson. As Tyler's facade falls, we're left with who he really is, a terrorist with a plan to blow up several credit card companies. And that plan itself is sort of confusing. Even in 1999, records did not solely exist in boxes locked within a building. Whether the buildings were leveled or not, our credit history chugs behind like a shadow under a high sun. But again, Tyler is attacking an idea, and he's doing it with complete disregard to actual facts or concern for life. Despite his grandstanding, he is doing it not for some great justice or attempt to put all of the US on a level playing field. He's doing it because it's fun. It's a continuation of what made us fall in love with him. So after all this, why does Tyler Durden still resonate almost 25 years later? Part of the allure is Pitt's performance. His crushing good looks coupled with what can only be described as an enviable swagger elevate Tyler from the page to our screens. He moves with an almost giddy excitement, bouncing with joy at the adventure the two boys are having. He reminds us of a carefree childhood, but now with the wants and desires of an adult. Tyler irks the responsibilities that's been thrust upon us and looks to be happy having an amazing time doing it. Until we shouldn't. That reveal we mentioned earlier not only puts Tyler's relationships with Marla and narrator into new contexts, but it puts the entire film under a different lens. Fight Club was famous for its Easter eggs and sly winks, like single frames of Tyler spliced into the film at opportune times or the director's claim that there was a Starbucks cup in every frame. It was Fincher broadcasting to us that this was inevitable. This was always a story about how a person like Tyler can destroy your life. There have been criticisms that the film ended too optimistically, maybe at the behest of the studio, but Hollywood has continuously tacked on entirely too nihilistic of endings. Author of Clockwork Orange, Anthony Burgess, hated Kubrick's adaptation so much he walked out of the premiere. He claimed the movie was too violent and bemoaned Kubrick for cutting the book's final chapter where the main character is rehabilitated. But in Fincher's ending, we see Tyler defeated. There is a clear voice telling us that what he was doing is wrong. Sadly, that's an idea that seems to be lost. As the years have passed, the ramifications and misinterpretations of the story have persisted, with new, modern fight clubs still perverting the film's false idol's message. Even in the cultural lexicon, films like Todd Phillips' The Joker have given us the idea of a disenchanted male rallying like-minded folk. Tyler is a terrifying and iconic villain because what he sells is appealing and not entirely wrong. But as we dig deeper, we see the costs of his wants, that his brand of faith is entirely in line with what he rallied us against, an entity who manipulated lonely people into feeling like they belong all so they could further their own wants. Do not fault us. Are there other villains who have lingered as heavy as Tyler Durden? Let us know down in the comments below, and as always, thank you for subscribing.